And this is Mitch Thornbrew. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Indian Health Service at headquarters. And I have with me Ms. Maya Lang um, from the Office of the CTO at HHS. Uh, and we're uh, pleased to talk with you today about the HHS IHS Mo Health Information Technology Modernization Research Project. That project has run over the, the last year. Um, and this uh, meeting is to help present the highlights of that project, as well as open it up for questions from stakeholders regarding the documents that have been released to date. Um, so with that introduction, I'll ask Ms. Maya Lang to, to give us an update. And I would ask you to hold your questions till the end of the presentation, um, but feel free to type those into the comments. Um, and we'll be looking for those uh, when we start the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to present to you um, an update on the uh, HIT modernization project um, uh, done in support with IHS and ONC. Uh, today the goal is, for, is to review the uh, project overview and approach, and this may not be um, new to many of you, and then understand what some of the findings were and discuss some of the future states as well as um, present to you the strategic and operational recommendations um, that we intend to use moving forward. Um, just briefly, it's been almost two years now, but about two years ago, the uh, VA uh, made the announcement that they were moving to Cerner. And as many of you may know, there are some current dependencies between the VA system and the system that Indian Health Service uses, our PMS, in order to support care delivery um, across the country for the 2.6 million American Indian Alaska Natives that it serves. Um, we know today that there are challenges with funding, um, and we know that the decision for the VA puts us in a position that we need to start to lay out what our objectives and timeline uh, will be in making a transition in health information technology for IHS. Um, we know that this needs to be timely, as the VA's transition will roughly be over the next 10 years, and there are um, many people across the tribal community that are very interested in uh, the advancement of this work. About a year ago, we executed a contract to be able to understand a few critical things, primarily the current state of health information technology across the ITU community, um, to identify um, to assess the legacy system, to present an analysis of alternatives, and to produce recommendations through um, the final roadmap as far as a strategy. In order to uh, deliver on this, we organized in a number of ways. Uh, many of you may have been involved. We conducted uh, interviews both virtually and in site, on site through uh, site visits. We had the opportunity to visit all 12 regions and a number of different facilities that met a, a range of demographic uh, requirements. We conducted a data call, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, additionally, we've assessed the legacy system, as I've mentioned, conducted a literary research, established a technical advisory commission of a, a small group of individuals to independently assess some of the findings and provide recommendations into the project team. All of these came together to inform an analysis of alternatives, um, a review of what a community of practice could look like, as well as a capability maturity model, and a strategic roadmap um, to move the project forward. When uh, kicking off this project, it's critical for us to recognize that um, we wanted to honor and respect the tribal communities and stakeholders, ensure that we're both people-centric as well as um, utilizing impactful and community service processes and, and to be data driven. We see this project in health information technology as being the intersection between people, process, and technology. And this thinking um, threads throughout the way that we executed um, over the past year in conducting this assessment. As I mentioned, um, we did have the opportunity to collect a wide range of data. Um, the image that you see in front of you represents the 12 regions that IHS or the ITU community um, exists within. The project team uh, spent time in all 12 of these regions. Uh, I've had the opportunity to participate in roughly 85% of those site visits, and it's been my pleasure um, to engage with the community as we've done that. 
Additionally, we uh, did a data call, and I think what's exciting to note here is that of that data call, we had slightly under 2,000 respondents. About 50% of those contributed independent responses, not just uh, this, this survey gives me a headache or I wish you would just uh, replace the system, but these were uh, very detailed responses around people's sentiments around the system and where there's opportunities for us to drive improvement. I think really early on what I can say here is that there's an overwhelming interest for something to happen here and that we know that improvements are needed in the system that's used in order to deliver care, our PMS. Um, also of note, that data call did not just go out to sites currently running our PMS. That was a comprehensive data call that included participation from sites that have moved on to commercial solutions. And we find this information relevant because we want to be able to compare and contrast um, the different care delivery settings and different solutions that are being used today. Um, so the current state overview, as I've mentioned here, that there is an overwhelming frustration with the current system, that the um, experience is disjointed and has limited functionality, that um, the aging code of our PMS cannot, be, cannot continue to be supported in the way that it is today, and that um, we know that we need to have enhancements in our hardware and network or more broadly in the infrastructure that supports um, our system. We know that there is a, a challenge when it comes to intra and intraoperability. We recognize that care delivery across the ITU community relies heavily on its ability to refer patients to different care settings and our ability to have a record that is comprehensive um, supports the continued goal of the ITU community in having this longitudinal patient record. Um, and then we know that from the analytics and reporting that there's a lot of challenges, particularly in our ability to look at population health analytics. Um, and we recognize that reporting criteria varies um, depending upon states and different programs that facilities may be participating in, and the system doesn't currently support um, the, the, the comprehensive needs. As I've mentioned, and this may not be a surprise, but as we begin to assess that, that diverse data set that we talked about, the, um, the most prevalent theme there is that there's an uh, incomplete system design and a disjointed user experience. Um, we know that there are challenges in the workforce um, in supporting um, the IT uh, needs on site that there's inconsistent training and support, that there's challenges with interoperability, um, and that there's inadequate technology and connectivity when we think about infrastructure. What I think to note here is that we also called out um, uh, comments from individuals as we engaged with them in the field and through these different surveys. We employed a very uh, human-centered or user-centered engagement in order to ensure that the people are recognized in the way that we are capturing data and identifying what is being prioritized by the people in the field around what we need to solution for. And so these circles are not um, a direct one-to-one -one ratio, but they do represent where um, the, the greatest uh, input has come from when we've engaged in the field. So what you're seeing here in this side is a reflection of the data call. And uh, what I think you can take away from this is really that lower quad, that lower quad that talks about 93% of users agree that now is the time for IHS to deploy a new health information technology system. Um, we we uh, here at the department and with IHS and our partners on this project hear very loud and clear that this is, a, this is something that needs to be addressed with, with a sense of urgency. And we, we hope to demonstrate through this presentation and ongoing engagement is a commitment to walk forward in addressing the challenges that we've identified, not only through this, um, this past year in this work, but additionally things that have come up in the continued engagement from IHS's um, leadership. We know that there's um, a desire for change that we need to address the technology infrastructure um, in order to usher in a modern solution, and that there are very distinct areas that we need to focus on early on. And those include the interoperability, reporting, usability, and data entry. And we recognize that these, may, these are elements that may, that can begin to be addressed even as we are thinking about what the modern EHR solution uh, will be. 
When we looked at the current state, and I think what's important to note here as I talk about this slide, is when we talk about modernization, we developed a definition for modernization because we know that modernization can mean many things. And so when we think about a system that um, supports care delivery across the ITU community, we know that this system must be resilient, that it must be able to respond to both internal and external changes, and that it will continue to evolve as the care delivery environment um, needs it to in order to meet the, um, those needs. And so as we define that, we looked at the current system and began to assess where we saw the current system meeting that need. And if we were to apply that definition today, we recognize that there are some inadequacies in the system. And when I say inadequacies, what I, what I want to very clearly state is that the system is able to function today, and it, it can and will continue to support the care delivery environment. But when we think about that ideal state of where we want a system to be, we recognize that it doesn't fully meet that need. And that is what we um, intend to communicate here in this slide. With that being said, we assessed the legacy system and we presented um, options for modernization. Uh, what you see in front of you are four options for modernization, but all of these four options require the stabilization of the existing system. As we look at an EHR modernization timeline, we recognize that an, an installation or implementation plan like this referenced against the VA would take us roughly 10 years. And we know that we will need or rely on the existing system to support care delivery as we go through this transition. And so when we look at the first option, stabilization, we see that as the, the essential foundationary activity in order to usher in modernization. The, our options then look at some renewal of the existing system, RPMS, and some, some envisioned future state. The second option is selective replacement, which, which entertains a best of breed, which could include multiple different commercial solutions. And the, the fourth option is being a full repa replacement, which would be um, the acquisition of a commercial solution and introduction into our environment. Noted here is that we have made no decisions around which one of these options we intend to, be, to take. The goal here is to communicate up to individuals making decisions around funding, that this is, these are our range of options, and we continue to conduct activities to further flush out which one of these options will make the most sense for us to pursue. So today, we do not know whether it is a renewal or it's an acquisition of a commercial solution. Moving into the future state vision, a lot of, if you had the opportunity to participate with us in the field, we not only talked about the challenges of today, but we asked individuals to talk to us about what tomorrow looks like. And when we think about the future state vision, we want to ensure that this vision is consistent with the vision of IHS to support healthy communities and quality healthcare systems through strong partnerships and culturally responsive practices. From there, we cascade that vision into the OIT's strategic vision to meet customer needs by providing excellent, reliable, interoperable health information services that protect privacy while connecting patients, providers, and payers, enabling improved patient outcomes and controlled cost and support of the IHS mission. With those two things being stated, the project has established a vision around modernization in that it supports the Indian Health Service mission to raise the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health of American Indian and Alaska Natives to the highest level through modern, innovative, and practical health information technology. We see this being accomplished through eight um, key components, those being a collaborative, ongoing relationship between um, the federal and tribal um, bodies, the establishment of consistent governance to help continue to orchestrate the many different areas that need to be addressed um, in this effort, that we know that this system needs to be convenient and patient-focused, that we need to develop a complete and comprehensive interoperable ecosystem, that it requires engaged end users, that we look towards a modern infrastructure, improve business intelligence and analytics, and uh, strong security. 
this slide here goes a little bit deeper around um, what we intend in those domain areas. So for example, when we talk about the relationship between the tribe, we want to continue to look at ways to engage the tribal community as we advance efforts in the HIT modernization um, by establishing a, 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 a body um, very close to the highest level of decision making to ensure that we can be reactive to the, to the sentiment or interest of the tribe. We want to ensure consistent organizational governance for leadership, and this includes the establishment of a, and I use the word governance loosely. When I say governance, it's really to help ensure that the many different area, domain areas, interoperability, analytics, legacy system, that we have a continued eye to ensure that we are putting the right level of investment in one area and not in ensuring that we're not missing certain components that are critical as we address this um, comprehensive uh, health information technology system. That we create an engaging, modern, and convenient system for patients. Again, this is engaging outside organizations and businesses to ensure that um, for those patients that are flowing both in a tribal community and perhaps to other um, private uh, entities or healthcare systems that we have a consistent engagement with that, with that process and that we're developing an end user portal that patients can engage with. Um, next, we want to engage end users to understand their needs. I see this as being and honoring the way that we've uh, been practicing to continue to have a path for patients and stakeholders to be able to engage with the project to share um, best practices and for us to hear challenges so that we can support prioritizing and addressing those elements. Provide full support for data exchange and interoperability between IHS systems and components. Um, it, is, it has been become very clear to me that some of our challenges with interoperability are not simply technical, that there are opportunities certainly within our policy to address some of the challenges with interoperability. Some of the benefits of um, this, this effort sitting within um, IHS and um, nestled within HHS is that we can leverage our federal partners, particularly the Office of the National Coordinator, to support us as we begin to work through challenges with interoperability and in systems. We look to improve analytics and business intelligence. We heard very loud and clear from the field that even with third-party solutions, the capture of analytics is something that um, we still continue to have challenges with, and we recognize a comprehensive solution here could benefit the, um, the entire ITU community. That we need to modernize the IHS HIT infrastructure. As we think about modern solutions, as we think about delivering technology to areas that have limited bandwidth, we recognize that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to um, create an environment that modern solutions can fit within. Um, there are many, uh, because this project also sits um, within a federal structure, there are a number of different federal priorities that we continue to have to keep in mind as we think about a modern IT solution. Some of those include cloud strategies, um, and while we do have rural sites, we recognize that that will not be something that we can achieve everywhere, but the, um, the goal is to constantly um, have those uh, best practices set by the federal government in place and addressed as we move through this modernization effort. Lastly, we need to look at strengthening the IHS security and compliance. Um, as we look at the comprehensive ecosystem, we want to ensure that we have a framework that ensures the delivery of um, the appropriate security evaluation and remediation, that we have the appropriate access controls in place related to data, and that we're, that we're looking at our compliance standards um, to ensure that they are uh, current. At high level, what this slide seeks to communicate is a timeline um, that we intend to deliver on. Um, so we are seeking funding for modernization in FY21. Um, the discovery project that I'm discussing happened in FY18. Over the next year in FY20, we, have, we are pursuing funding to continue uh, support of this effort as we move towards um, developing an acquisition strategy for FY21. 
noted that that is contingent upon funding being identified for this um, EHR procurement. In the next year, there are critical things that we need to do in order to prepare for that time. The first is that governance that I talked about that continues to help usher and guide in um, the different components we need to address, as, we're, as well as leverage <coughs> the expertise of stakeholders both across the HHS um, environment as well as some of our other uh, federal partners. That we need to begin to address stabilization of our PMS because we recognize this is a system we will continue to need to rely on as we go through um, an implementation of a modern EHR. Um, and we need to look at the infrastructure um, and conduct an assessment and begin to um, build out what that will look like as we move towards a modern environment. I, this slide, and I'll let this sit here, um, calls out again the things that I've mentioned earlier and where we want to begin to focus initial efforts. And this modernization and planning and execution, the earliest things that we are looking to establish is the project um, management office. This PMO continues to look at, would continue to look at the acquisition strategy. It would begin to prepare for um, an acquisition. It would begin to look at the orchestration of the different domain areas, and it would establish a body and it, that would allow for um, engagement from individuals outside of the federal government to be able to um, participate in this uh, HIT modernization effort. Largely in the domain area, as I mentioned, um, stabilization of RPMS and addressing some of the early wins that have been identified in the project. Um, continued look at data exchange, particularly around inter and intraoperability, as well as reporting in analytics, and then the infrastructure assessment for um, determining what would be needed to move towards a modern infrastructure. Immediate next steps, I think this really just, again, drives in the things that I just mentioned. Um, and so with that, I'm going to, I'm super early, but, um, Here's my contact information as well as Mitch's, and I believe um, if there's no comments, then we can open for questions. That's correct. Thank you, Ms. Lang. We don't have any questions pending on the chat, um, but we are uh, open for questions uh, coming on the phone lines. You can put your question in the chat window and we can respond to it. If you would, raise your hand and we can unmute your line. To, uh, ask your question. In the software, there is a raise your hand under set status. So we have a question from the chat um, asking if this is the same call that is scheduled for the next two meetings. That is correct. This was intended to be a series. Um, of calls to answer questions regarding the modernization project, the final report um, and presentation that we just saw, but as well as the two documents that were recently released, the technology roadmap and the final report. We will have this exact same call um, in early December um, two more times to make sure that everyone uh, has a chance to, to participate. These documents are located on the Indian Health Service website under newsroom, under um, letters. Um, so this is a Dear Tribal Leader letter that was released um, on November 15th, and that is out on the website now with a link to both the letter that is, go that is on its way out as well as the two documents that I mentioned, the technology roadmap and the final report. And we'll just stand by for a couple of minutes in case there's a question that comes to mind and, and give everyone an opportunity to either type um, or ask that question by raising their hand uh, using the, the hand on the software. And Mr. Hughes will unmute you um, to speak to the group.
and we have a question. Um, was there a type of funding analysis done for a range of how much the different options would cost? Mm -hmm. It will be a key factor for tribes to advocate for as soon as possible. Um, I know the budget formulation work group recommendation was $3 billion over 10 years. Does IHS support this, uh, this funding over 10 years? So um, an analysis, the analysis of alternatives did include um, funding estimates in order to pursue those options. That um, the structure of that analysis of alternatives is consistent with the VA's um, modeling of assessing what this would cost. Um, that that document it, we had to FOIA from the VA. So uh, we know that uh, IHS serves about 2.6 million Americans. Um, the VA serves roughly about 9 million. Um, for the sake of this project and for our acquisition purposes, we are not able to release the funding estimates um, because of the um, the selection process. Um, and I, I at this time can't. Uh, I can't provide what our number is. Correct. And for the second part of that question, um, IHS uh, fully supports looking uh, to parity with the VA as a base for our funding requests um, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. And we do anticipate that this will be a multi-year project um, from seven to up to 10 years for that funding to cover. And we would also like to, to point out that um, IHS commitment to that process uh, has been established in the President's budget request, um, but we are awaiting final funding in 2021 as well as funding this year for the project uh, to continue. Mm -hmm. We'll continue to stand by for another minute to see if another question comes in. Thank you for the previous questions. Um, and we'll give you a moment to compose your thoughts and, and go through the process of asking the question if you want to ask verbally on the phone line or if you'd like to put that in the chat. For the up, uh, so we have a question on the chat. For the upcoming health IT funding proposed in the Congressional Appropriations Bill, what will, what will that funding be used for since House proposed $25 million, but the Senate only proposed $3 million? It's a great question. Um, I think right now we're in, we are, with this, the, the CR that's in place, we are in continued discussion with the um, congressional staffers and our funding officials um, to advocate for the needs of that funding. Um, so we have, the, the good thing is that it's included in, in both proposals. Um, we, uh, we hope to receive the full $25 million. Um, some of the things that we've identified in the presentation around early next steps would be supported with that funding. So the, the PMO shop, the assessment of the infrastructure, um, addressing some of the early um, challenges with interoperability. Um, and continued work around the EHR acquisition strategy. Thank you for that question, and, and thank you, Ms. Lang, for that response. We also have another question asking, will the slides be posted? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I think we can attach it in the meeting. Um, if not, we will include that in, in uh, some other form and send it out to the group but we will make the slides available. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll stand by another minute to see if um, someone is forming a question and give them an opportunity to get that out. And we do, we have another question. With seven to ten year implementation period, when would tribes see the start of the implementation? 
-hmm. So we, we have not done any preliminary prioritization of sites. We do know that once we go through the process to make a decision about how we will build the infrastructure, that the industry standard and, and the experience um, that we've heard about from our tribal partners as well as some of our other stakeholders um, indicates that that's a 12 to 18 month build time. Mm -hmm. And so that's building and developing that infrastructure, getting it ready to support users and that we would start that uh, the first user implementation in 2023. Okay. So it would be at that time before any user um, could would be brought onto the system tentatively. And that's contingent on funding being made available in the timelines as we had indicated earlier in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And so that's subject to change because of course we can't commit um, to those activities until the funding is made available, but that is the tentative plan. And again, just to reinforce, we, we haven't done a site selection survey to understand who would go first uh, in a multi-year rollout, um, but that's definitely work that we know we have to do ahead of time, both for preparation of the site, preparation of our infrastructure, funding requirements. So we, we would anticipate that being part of that planning process and that tribes that might be selected would have most likely a year in advance notice um, for local preparation and impact assessments as we look at those sites. And we would probably um, roll out the one year in advance for sites so we don't anticipate showing a site uh, a pathway that goes from year one to year seven, but we would be a rolling one year or two year look ahead um, because the variables that we would use to make those decisions change too quickly. Um, so we might not want to commit or it might not be the right uh, order um, for something that was planned seven years ago once we get to those final rounds. So we do look at that as a rolling planning um, activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have an additional question. Is the, is the, asking if the funding is for RPMS improvements or the new system? And that's a great question. So as we indicated in the presentation, there are certain activities that need to happen to set RPMS and our existing infrastructures and users up for success as we implement a new system. So I would like to say that the answer is that the funding is for the new system. However, there may be activities in RPMS that support that ultimate goal, recognizing that we have infrastructure needs um, that need to be addressed as, as quick as possible. But the, the funding is for the new system. Uh, another question, once the funding is secure, how long uh, would the RFP process and determination take? We're, we're, we're building that acquisition strategy right now. So assuming that funding flows in FY21, we would, we would hope to have um, a contract executed, you know, by the end of that fiscal year. But we don't have a full acquisition strategy yet. Um, we are we're building that out in FY20. We have an additional question. What is your time frame for the RPMS improvements mentioned in your presentation? So we, we anticipate um, some work early um, for early wins, improving uh, interoperability and training. We anticipate those would happen um, in potentially starting as early as this year, depending on the funding requirements. Um, but going into 2021 and 2022, recognizing that we will continue to do the necessary work to make sure RPMS is a viable solution as long as we have uh, federal and tribal partners using it to take care of patients across the country. And we're just holding on. It looks like we have another question coming in.
Uh, the question is, what is the time frame to get 2015 certification? So the RPMS development team is working closely uh, with um, our analysts and in informatics across the country. We've actually done some work uh, directly with the ONC about what it takes to meet those standards. We're developing the, the timeline and the funding requirements to meet that goal. We are anticipating meeting that 2015 certification in 2020, um, possibly early 2021. Again, um, that's dependent on some funding solutions separate from this project. So just to tie that back in with the previous questions, we are pursuing 2015 certification um, and funding, but we are not pursuing it through the modernization project. Another question, what are the training opportunities post-award? So we, we haven't developed a training plan um, for what that would look like, again, because we've not done system selection. And so the, uh, a training plan has to be tightly integrated with that decision. Um, so, but we do have that earmark. That's a critical activity. So this is a great question because we recognize that one of the first things we need to do is both have implementation training close to go live to support users that are tra transitioning to new systems, as well as having a more robust system to training new users and onboarding new staff as a continuous process after go live. And so we do uh, contemplate having uh, a, a robust training plan, um, but that wouldn't be available until we get further down the selection process and in that last bit of infrastructure build and, and planning. An additional question, the Portland area is very unique when it comes to EHR systems. We have 40% of our tribes on other systems and only have clinics, not hospitals. Please take into consideration the other COT systems and differences in needs for tribal clinics compared to tribal hospitals, as well as the differences for direct service facilities versus Title I facilities versus Title V facilities. Um, very astute comment and, and question. I would respond that it was absolutely critical as we looked across the country to engage all of our stakeholders to understand some of those nuances. Um, we don't, uh, you know, while we have a good foundation based on the site visits, the 25 site visits across the country, we will continuously be looking for opportunities to uh, have more discussions with the broad range of ITU facilities across the country. So, and again, we looked at large facilities, small facilities, acute plus acute plus um, primary care or outpatient in systems, as well as rural uh, facilities, some of our more metropolitan areas, as well as users that were on RPMS across the ITUs, but also at our partners who have moved to COT solutions um, to get as much learning and information as we can from uh, those endeavors. And again, I'd just like to point out, um, I think we have a lot of advantages when it comes to our tribal partners and our ITU partners across the country leading in this regard. We have examples to lean on and we definitely, uh, want to make sure that we leverage the learning that they're able to give us as we move forward in the process. An additional question, um, could you include training opportunities within the RFP with vendor selection? So that's a, that's a great comment. Um, we, again, we, I think that's tied to our planning. Um, for the selection, I, I think at the point that we make a selection, that training will be addressed in the RFP um, because that's part of the requirements and some of the, that we would look to the vendor that we might ultimately choose on best practices, um, resources and information that they have that we can leverage, um, as well as uh, an eye towards uh, what I talked about earlier, a robust training plan within the, within the IHS supported system to make sure that we have a plan for both onboarding and part of the rollout process, as well as 
uh, bringing new employees on and having consistent annual education and support to be effective in that role as well. And we'll continue to stand by. There's a couple more questions that looks like coming. Uh, how will the migration of data be, accomp be accomplished? So that's a great question and one that we're, we're thinking about now. This is where we're looking to our um, some of the VA activities that have gone to try to understand their best practices. And lessons learned, we've also talked to tribes and tribal partners that have uh, transitioned their systems, um, and that's part of um, what will engage the industry to understand the best path forward to move our data and protect the value that we have in that data into a space that can be persisted regardless of system and connected uh, in a very discrete data, uh, with very discrete data elements into the new system. Um, so we have some ideas about what's important, and that's based on uh, feedback that we've received from stakeholders, uh, some industry uh, uh, market research that, that we've done, um, and we know that, that we have to address the um, value that we have in the RPMS data and bring that forward or not lose that data as we migrate to a new system. But, but again, the focus will be on you know, what industry standards can we leverage um, to put that data in a place that we can then consume it from any vendor, if you will. Um, and that's part of an overall strategy that uh, I, I need to touch on as far as we understand that some tribes have already committed to, to vendors across the country and that as we look at the architecture, we want to respect that we may need to think about data agnostic from not only uh, any one vendor, but not build it around the solution that we pick, but build it around industry standards so that it's, uh, so that it's compatible and interoperable across the country with previous investments by tribes. Another question, will a new system be utilized through mobile and on medical devices? So part of what we did in this um, work is use a lot of human-centered design. And what we saw called out in that work was the need to have access to the um, electronic health record while in the field. We know that there's a lot of um, clinical staff and clinical support staff that are delivering in the field. We are calling that out as a part of the requirement. So part of what we did in that information gathering through the site visits was to identify those unique things that are needed through the system as we think about um, what it looks like moving forward. And we did identify this need to have access to the EHR in remote locations as being a requirement. So it is something that we've identified and called out. Thank you for those questions. We see some folks are typing, so we'll stand by for some additional questions to come through. Uh, an additional question, will a new system include pharmacy, lab, radiology, et cetera? So um, the simple answer is yes, um, but I would expand a little bit to say that we've looked at the full range of services provided across the ITU systems and, and are looking to address each of those components and needs um, what I want to be careful to say is respectful of the approaches that we identified, um, depending on the approach, we may look for best of suite versus best of breed versus a rewrite of those components. 
Um, but we absolutely did look at the breadth of services being provided, both acute care, um, outpatient services, specialty services, um, to include behavioral health, um, as well as optometry and some other items. We do recognize that we have a strong dental base with Dentrix, and the plan is to continue to look at that as our primary investment for dental, um, but looking at ways to make that fully interoperable in, in a bidirectional way um, at, a, at a national level for Dentrix as well. So I added a little bit more to that, but, but absolutely a great question, and thank you for asking. Uh, another good question, when are comments from tribes on the report EHR needs due? So that's a great question. So we have actually open consultation and urban confer at this time. It's been open for a few years now. We will continue to look um, um, to uh, our tribes and our partners for uh, consultation and, and confer in that venue. We have um, additional meetings coming up for uh, repeats of this webinar, um, as well as uh, when we get to a point in time that we need those, we will put a notice out to tribes um, if a deadline um, is on the horizon. But at this time, we do not anticipate a deadline or cutoff for your comments. Another question, is IHS recommending a single uh, HIT solution regarding an EMR or a variety of HIT solutions that sites can choose from that best fits their service delivery model? Another great question. Thank you for that one. We um, have not made a decision about if we're looking at a single procurement. Um, as we've uh, talked about our procurement strategy, some of the feedback that we got from tribes was an opportunity for us to um, select an enterprise EHR, but uh, almost secondarily, that may not be quite the right framework, um, to, to um, recognize that we have use, a user base on uh, some systems and, and look at efforts to leverage that nationally to reduce costs for the tribes that are on those systems or people that want to look at other systems. At this time, we are looking at a full um, selection process where we would operate um, that or some of that infrastructure, and so that's going to definitely be part of the offering. We don't want to just have contract vehicles out for people to tap into. We need to operate and manage some of that infrastructure um, for our direct service sites, respecting tribes' ability to 638. You know, all of those um, items are coming into, into consideration, um, but we've not made a decision or closed the door on uh, representing um, some sort of activity with multiple vendors from a procurement strategy standpoint that tribes may be able to leverage. And again, that was comments that came from um, some of the sites as we did the site visits across the country as well as it showed up in some of the 2,000 comments that we received from the data call. Will the EHR system be available on iPads? Uh, we do anticipate making um, components of the EHR available on the iPad. We do recognize that uh, not all functionality is supportable on a mobile device, but we are going to put that as part of our requirements, um, as Ms. Lang had indicated, because it's a key component of what we would define as a modernized infrastructure. So there will be a mobile component. Um, and typically, just to, to dive into that a little bit, typically um, you can do orders and review a lot of things, sign things from iPads, but um, they're not always the best uh, avenue for certain things. So we. We've not stipulated uh, any more than that, but we do know that um, they w mobile devices will be part of that infrastructure. I there's an additional question about PRC. We do anticipate um, having a solution for purchase and referred care. There are lots of um, supportable options in the industry that are not just the traditional PRC components that we operate within IHS. The industry actually has a lot of experience with the commercial vendors specifically 
running self-insured hospitals that adjudicate their own claims, and that starts to look a lot like the functionality that we need for purchase and referred care. However, we would have a um, we would have you know stringent requirements and speaking specifically to our PRC needs and anything that would go out to the industry. An additional question: If I if tribes move to a cot system, how will IHS financially support that move? So we currently recognize tribes' uh, ability and authority to 638 and uh, uh, use their tribal shares in the way that they see fit, either under a Title I contract or a Title V uh, compact, and we will continue to support those efforts. As far as the funding that comes down for the modernization, we're not in a position to speak to what the appropriators might allow or, or uh, specify in those requests. But that's something that we acknowledge as a question that, that we need to um, keep in mind as we talk about um, what that funding looks like. And I would continue to, to um, encourage tribes to use the, their existing avenues to support funding. And we will absolutely approach this as an opportunity for uh, tribal consultation and urban confer when any new money would, would come available. Um, but again, just uh, tribes still have all of the existing avenues um, to push um, their opinions through that process um, in the way that the, the budgets are currently handled. And I'm not showing any additional questions. Um, we do have time, so we're going to stand by for just a minute to see if anybody's um, that has sparked any questions or they're looking to raise their hand to ask a, a question on the phone, or we'll continue to take uh, questions from the comments. All right, we have an additional question. Um, it would be beneficial for the area IHS offices to hold consultation sessions via in-person meeting and via webinar to gather additional information. Additionally, the Tribal Advisory Committee uh, must be set up as soon as possible to begin discussions on the report and other issues for HHS and IHS to consider before making a final decision. We agree. We agree, thank you. <laughs> So when will the advisory committee be set up? So we're, we're engaging in that planning now. It's part of um, what we would intend to do in 2020 once we have some of the funding involved because we would need to support those meetings, support um, gathering that feedback. So that is um, one of the first uh, actionable items we'll be working towards um, just as soon as we can get the, start, uh, the project started after um, the CR ends and we receive uh, final funding and whether that's 25 million or 3 million um, as indicated in the different um, documents that are uh, going through the budget process, forming um, that uh, advisory committee is one of the first steps. All right, we'll, we'll stand by for another minute to see if we have another question come in. We've got about five minutes left on the call.
the question, we've got a question, who would be a good contact to follow up on this with questions later? Um, so I've provided my contact information, um, and so I'm happy to receive um, questions, and we can distribute those, make them part of our FAQs. Uh, so you absolutely have uh, all the options available to you with IHS, um, so at any any meeting that you have with IHS, anytime uh, we, we have future conferences, you're, you're able to ask those questions, um, and, and I'm happy to receive them via email or a phone call um, at any time from our stakeholders. We've got a good question about, um, can you discuss the strategy around analytics, best of breed, or built in with the MR solutions? Um, that, that's a great question. So there's lots of options with EHRs having built-in analytics. Um, we are looking at an overall strategy that has a, a layer um, to meet our NIPRs and National Data Warehouse environment, as well as the operational aspects um, that are typically done by EHRs. We have not made a decision, again, because we don't know if we're going to go best of, you know, redesign, best of breed, or um, best of suite, but we do anticipate having uh, the national data warehouse needs integrated so that we have tight integration coming from data from our EHR, and we're open to discussions and looking to make sure that we have the best population health solutions. And so it's a little early to say what our design will be, but that's a great question and one that we'll be posing to the industry and looking for feedback uh, as we design how our data infrastructure looks. Um, but those are the key components. Again, we know that if you're operating a health system, you have a lot of operational data needs that help you provide um, care. Um, we know that you need population health data, um, and we know that, that we need to support the National Data Warehouse and NIPRS environment for GIPR reporting and other national reports with the identified um, deduplicated patient data. And so we're getting close to the end of time, um, but I wanted to take a moment to um, express my thanks for the engagement and the great questions that you've provided. I hope this um, was a good session for you, and, and we will repeat this session um, the first week of December. There are two additional um, sessions scheduled. And I'm just going to double check the time. So it looks like um, December 3rd and 4th at 3 p.m., but we will post that information so that you have it. Oh, it looks, yeah, um, Mr. Hughes was able to post that in the chat. So I would look at the, the chat. He's got the, the dates and the times in there. So it's December 3rd at 1 p.m. to 2.30 and December 4, 3 to 4.30 Eastern time. Are there any additional questions before we close? All right, with that, we will conclude the call. And uh, again, I appreciate your participation and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.